Hello everyone and welcome to the Media Voices podcast. I'm Esther Thorpe and you're listening to the second episode of a four-part series looking at future-proofing local news, supported by the Google News Initiative. Over this series, we'll be talking to some of the publishers working to find resilient business models, how they've evolved company culture and practice to do this, and what tools and trends they're working with to prepare for the next decade. The first episode explored the historical context around local news, shifts in the UK and European markets, and what good local news might look like. This episode, we're looking at which business models will help local news publishers thrive in the coming years. We've spoken to a number of organisations across Europe, from more established brands to startups, to find out what they're doing, and in some cases, what they're changing to future-proof themselves. We'll also look at the importance of quality news content as part of a local news business model, building on the question of what makes good local news. Before we get into the case studies, there were some top-level points which came out of the discussions we had with experts for these episodes. One theme was how much print and digital came up as dividing terms when it came to business models. It can be easy to assume most publishers have embraced digital publishing by now, but profit margins in digital are notoriously tricky, and it's an area publications across Europe have really struggled with. Professor Dr Vibke Movin, Professor of Journalism at TU Dortmund Institute for Journalism, has noticed an even bigger shift in reading habits in recent years and notes that the industry in Germany hasn't really found a way to adapt. I don't know if you use public transports, but I do. And I see less and less over the last year, I saw less and less people reading really a printed newspaper. We all were staring at our uh, phones or if you're you're on on a longer way, maybe your tablet or whatever, but it's you are reading digital. And the way of digital um, reading behaviors, of, I think it's it's substantial different from reading a print newspaper because you have different habits like like scrolling over a, a web page is a very different thing like like really read yourself through a printed newspaper. So the way from the shift from reading on print to reading on digital is. In fact, additional shift from reading a newspaper as a whole thing and reading then in the digital, you are reading not a newspaper, you are reading articles. So until now, I don't know exactly if it's the same way in the other European countries, but paying just for one article is till now not a very common way of financing because the price then often, we have some trying of doing that, but the amount of paying then for one article is so high compared to the amount of buying the whole newspaper that often people are yeah, not willing to, to, to do this because then it comes again to the question, is it really worth it? That's not to say there's no place for print in the local news landscape, but even in areas where locals are still reliant on print, they're not necessarily paying for it. Nicolas Negrin, editor-in-chief of one of Grupo Editorial Artistas' daily newspapers, Journal de Vincenza, shares what he's noticed in northern Italy. You have to know, uh, we have a big problem with the the copy, because uh, the young people don't buy the, the newspaper. So the copies are, are, are going down. For me, uh, it's a, a problem because if I, I have to talk, think about 20 years mm-hmm. from 20 years, so I'm going to be uh, 57 years old. Uh, maybe I'm, I'm still working. I'm a, and uh, I think, what about? And so for this, uh, we, are, we are trying to, to work with a website and with some project to try to find I think it's a, a general problem. Our audience for the print is uh, the, 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 the old people, or the, if, if we, only the old people are going to, to buy the newspaper. But I have to say that uh, our, our newspaper is in, is in the bar. When you go to the bar in, 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 uh, in, in Italy, we have, uh, so in Veneto, many Osteria is like the, the little bar where, where the old people at, at 10 o'clock they are going, uh, they are <laughs> drinking wine. And um, you find a cheap newspaper. 
at, in every bar. Our newspaper and La Gazzetta dello Sport, which is the sport, uh, national sport newspaper. Uh, so the people look, read, uh, many people read. In fact, uh, I think, uh, I, I don't know if you, if you know that, uh, um, for, for example, Sky, uh, the, if, you are, if you have a bar, you're going to pay uh, so much because many people are going to, to see. And so uh, I, I, I think that uh, a bar have to, to pay more for, the, for our newspaper. Because if you, it's normal. You don't, you don't want to pay one euro and 70 cents for, for a newspaper instead to go to the bar, take a coffee, just one euro, and, and look to the, to the news. Benedict Ortre, Google's head of news partnerships for the UK, Ireland and Northern Europe, talked about the sustainability index they consulted on with the FT last episode. From that work, she saw that those heavily reliant on print revenue are in a far less sustainable position. So those heavily reliant on print revenue are the least sustainability ready, and it's exemplified by the pandemic. So publishers that continue to rely on print revenue are worse positioned. For example, in the publishers that generate between uh, not to 20% and 20% to 40% of their revenue from digital have an average of sustainability readiness score of 57. And this is notably lower than publishers with uh, more revenue coming from digital between 40% and 80%. So obviously there is a direct correlation between the two. Ironically, despite all social media's attempts to connect us better, Community building is the area legacy local news publishers have struggled with, as Benedict explains. At the local news level, people still trying to figure out the transition from print to digital. So the, the community building was always an interesting part of print. And people are experimenting with uh, things like uh, getting closer to the local providers, so making more of the uh, look after your community in every sense of the way so that they can diversify also the, the revenue coming from that. So, for example, wine clubs or local produce, uh, market producers, baskets that you can buy, anything like that. But I'm observing more of that it's harder for them to make the transition because, one, they don't have the expertise, and two, a lot of 80% of the revenue is still coming from that print. So it's hard to let go and other invest into the digital because at some point this is where they will have to be. That's not to say the startups have got it all right. Dr. Vibke Moving brought up something that we've had mentioned before when discussing local news, that founders are often very motivated by the cause and the journalistic mission, but few have little idea about the business side of a local news business. Journalists are not longer satisfied by the way They had to be done their jobs in the newspaper. Um, So that is a very idealistic way. Then, of course, you have unemployed journalists. Uh, They find themselves maybe in a position that they don't want to move away and uh, are looking for other possibilities to, to do their job what they love. So that is maybe the root of coming out from a journalistic, uh, professional perspective. And then you have an idealistic uh, additional way, like then it comes more to community and maybe non-professional, but it hasn't to be non-professional. That people were saying, I'm not able to get um, proper information about my neighborhood, so I do it myself. And um, this is a very, it's another approach of idealistic way. Um, but you see, it's the roots of new models are often idealistic and not business orientated. And maybe that is a problem. We, in, we have different um, organizations who starts now to give them some advices uh, how to do it on, uh, on a proper business way just to explain what is a business model. Uh, where do you get your money from? How do, how do you get some insurance if, if, there, if it comes um, to law and to, to all the questions uh, of law in the context of journalistic or media work? 
And um, so we have a lot of initiatives and uh, a lot of them are doing good work, but struggling in, a, in the finance way. So they often work maybe with donations or with kind of subscriptions. You have to be a very idealistic and a very, you have to really to have the, the feeling of empowering yourself because of your work. And it's, it's lovely to talk to them because they, they were so full of energy and full of, of, of uh, looking forward. I really hope um, that they find a way that it works out financial as well. Even for the most business savvy founders, there's not necessarily a model that is guaranteed to work for every area. The Public Interest News Foundation's Jonathan Heward cooks up a couple of metaphors to make his point. I think it's more like making different, lots of different cakes. You know, there's going to be a series of, of elements, but you can put them together in infinitely different, different ways. And some, some of the cakes are going to end up being pretty inedible. <laughs> and some are maybe going to be a bit too sweet. I mean, it looks to us, looking at, at our annual index, the outlets that are doing best tend to have much more diverse revenues. So there is, there is a classic, sorry, no, 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 I'm mixing my metaphors, but there's, you know, you do not put all your eggs in one basket. Everyone, as you know, is always talking about reader revenue. In the independent sector, that's still not a very significant part. It's about 22% of overall revenue. 52% is still advertising. My own view is that probably that balance needs to switch. Then you want to see reader revenue making up more like half of the mix. And in some cases, it'll, it'll make up a lot more. And in some cases, it'll make, make up a bit less. I think it depends partly on the nature of the area. If you're in Manchester and there's a large potential market and there's a big chunk of that, which is pretty middle class, affluent, highly educated people that, that get it, that are prepared to subscribe, then you can really go all out on, on reader revenue. Other, other places, that just isn't going to, it's just not there. You're going to have to think about ad revenue and just thinking about doing that in a sensible way. We'd obviously love to see more philanthropic funding available in general. And we, we think there is a role for government in, in carefully structured ways. Government can underwrite certain costs, could provide match funding, could provide tax breaks, tax credits, as we've seen in Canada. There's a lot of things government could be doing to actually help. But in my view, as a bridge to genuine sustainability, not necessarily as a long-term subsidy, but just to get us through the current moment of crisis and opportunity. Now, we'll hear directly from some local news organisations across Europe about their own journey with business models. UK-based Social Spider publishes five community newspapers in London. We'll let Managing Director David Floyd introduce the business. We are a, a not-for-profit uh, local news publisher. So we've been working in the world of communities and media for, for a long time, since uh, 2003, and had worked uh, on media training with young people and also uh, running a national mental health magazine. And then in 2014, we decided it seemed like a great point to jump into the market for local news. So uh, we founded our first local newspaper, Waltham Forest Echo, in uh, 2014 and have gradually built up to a group of six local news publications. And the aim really is to create the best possible local news publications that can be created in the challenging market context of the, the post-internet age. And the main way we've done that, which is different from what other people do, is working very directly with local communities, including getting people in local communities to contribute content, particularly features content to our newspapers, but also on the distribution and advertising side and, and all the other elements that go together to make news publications work. We have uh, yeah, looked to work directly with the local communities in the areas we, we serve in um, north, east and, and central London. When we started in 2014, once again, I suppose in a slightly unusual move, we, we very much had a print first model and it was you know, we have monthly print newspapers uh, and our single biggest source of income is print advertising. So we have 
mass distribution in the sense of you know, around 15,000 copies in most of the boroughs we operate in, uh, going out three each month. And print, print advertising is our single biggest source of income. But that's been changing quite a lot over the past two or three years, particularly. So, so there's now um, we have uh, a range of revenue streams, uh, you know, an increasing sort of revenue mix, um, and you know the, the online. Yeah, we've always had websites, and, and for most of our existence, most of the content has gone up on the websites as well. But we have much more of a, a digital first strategy for news now. And the features content is. You know, often still print first but in terms of the, the new stuff that is going up immediately and you know, you know, the web is a much much bigger part of, of what we do in terms of our offer to readers um, as we will probably come on to in terms of actually being financially viable you know online local news is you know, still a real challenge. David points out that there is always a ceiling to true local news in terms of audience size so where to have a presence is a commercial decision as online advertising simply can't support it alone. In terms of seeing revenue in the round and the overall situation of the brand, then, then it, it is a commercial decision in, like, in terms of the maximum number of people in each of our local areas being aware of what we do and taking an interest in the publications, then having a, a meaningful online presence and delivering a, a new service online is, is really, really important to that. And, and there's obviously some readers for whom picking up a print copy of the paper is not really uh, how they're looking at things. And, and that, that, so, that, so there's definitely a strand of the readership for whom that's, that's very important. In terms of direct commercial impact, we're not getting large amounts of money from online advertising. And, and I think that is kind of the conundrum that, that I think we're all still a very long way away from solving the, the way that advertising works online. There isn't any way that you could meaningfully fund genuinely local journalism through that. And you know, we all know that you know, the corporate groups tackle that by you know, syndicating stories nationally across all their theoretically local publications. If you are actually trying to do things with a genuinely local focus. There isn't any way that even if 100% of the population of a London borough viewed your site every month, that would not bring in enough revenue from online advertising to pay for the journalism. So so you know, that's the challenge that you have there. But where it does have a commercial benefit is in terms of our membership schemes, which are effectively, you know, well, I think we're moving towards calling them supporter schemes now. They're effectively donation schemes where people who support the existence of the local publication donate a certain amount each month to support us. And we have, I mean, across our publications, we have you know, over 600 towards 700 people making those donations on a monthly basis. So it's meaningful income. It comes up to sort of 10, 15% of our, our monthly income, depending on how the other income goes in any given month. It's obviously a very long way off actually paying for the service itself. So that income mix is, you know, it's important to have an income mix, but it it's, remains a real challenge. Like all good publishers, Social Spider is reliant on a mix of incomes. Crucially, David points out that they're very aware that there is no silver bullet and that keeping the lights on is an ongoing process. Yeah, the mix of print advertising revenue some revenue from our email newsletters. There's some advertising that, that goes that goes through them. Uh, the the supporter income, and now we have, we have we have bits and bobs in terms of the Google News Showcase scheme, which we've recently become part of via um, Independent Community News Network sort of consortium. So we have that, and then we also have three funded posts uh, within the journalism team. Um, the local democracy reporter scheme, which people will probably be familiar with, where we have we host the two uh, local democracy reporters covering the local areas that, that we're based in, and uh, then we also have a funded role as part of the um, meta-funded community news projects uh, via the That's NCCJ. Right. So we have a community reporter for the, the Tottenham area funded funded via that. So that combination of stuff just about adds up and i mean in terms of our revenue for the papers like d directly from the newspapers has been growing fast this year and i think last month or the, you know, the current month the august issues of the paper 
was our, our biggest ever month for, for newspaper income across that that combination of income streams. So it, it, you can stitch it all together. I don't know if that's really the right right phrase, but you, you, you can make the bits come together to work. But it is it is a real ongoing challenge. There isn't a a magic solution which you can say, oh, we've cracked this. You know, the money's going to be rolling in for the next few decades. French local news site Roy Catherine of Strasbourg, a publication covering a city of around 270,000 people in northeast France, had high hopes when starting out. But they had a reality check when they realised the path to sustainability would take much longer than planned, as co-founder Pierre France explains. We, we started in 2012. We had uh, very high ambitions because in, uh, you have to remember what it was, the web, uh, like 11 or 12 years ago, it was full of promises. Uh, it was easy. Uh, it was for everyone. So uh, we wanted to build a media that was much more uh, easy uh, to read and much more in-depth for news uh, with the accessibility of the World Wide Web at the time. So we thought about a media uh, that was uh, free uh, and completely advertisement funded. And uh, we thought at that time that in a year, uh, the media would gain sustainability. Well, that didn't go as planned uh, <laughs> at all, anywhere. So uh, quickly, it became obvious that uh, even with our current advertisement model, we wouldn't go very far uh, and very high. So we took uh, two years before we could uh, even pay ourselves. And uh, after five years, it became obvious that we had to switch to a, a paid business uh, model with subscribers. Roy Catherine of Strasbourg is one of three local independent franchised offshoots of national news site Roy Catherine of. This recognition of the parent brand helped them grow initially. We became very popular very quickly uh, because we had a brand name uh, that was already popular. Uh, when we launched, we launched uh, uh, alongside uh, national media, which is called Roy Catherine and that media launched itself in 2007 and was very popular nationally. When we saw this, uh, we wanted to do exactly the same as they did, but at the local level. So that's why we uh, call ourselves Ricket for Enough Strasbourg, and then we partnered and, uh, and we, we shared uh, the same identity uh, as we can so we really gained from their uh, from their audience and uh, uh, notoriety uh, at the start yeah and we became very popular also because we were free and there weren't many news uh, sources on the web at that time in 2017 the publication decided to launch a subscription product now, half of their total revenue is from readers. Since we, uh, we started 100% uh, advertisement, it has been uh, a slow decline in our mix, the advertisement. And in 2002, advertisement is only uh, a third of our total revenue. And now half of our total revenue is from subscriptions. We try to keep it small. What we are trying to advertise is that we want everyone to participate to the local funding of the news with uh, something uh, that will be, uh, I don't know the English word, but not very meaningful in terms of amount. You know, like anyone can participate. It's five euros per month. Even if you don't read us every day, you participate into something that allows a local media independent to exist. The team debated what sort of paywall to use and whether to just ask for a donation, which would be their ideal model. But as Pierre explains, at a local level, this just wouldn't convert enough people. Instead, they have some content-free but exclusive work paywalled. Uh, ideally, uh, it would be like a donation, 
the subscription would be like a donation to allow us to keep the website free. But uh, at a local level, this principle is not working at all. We don't have uh, enough reach to convert uh, like the 0.1% of our audience to a donator. So we have to use the payroll and uh, part of it is uh, part of our production is behind the paywall. Most of, of our inquiries, uh, our exclusive work is behind the paywall. So the, the principal benefit for, for the subscribers is to get past the paywall. Uh, although this is not an ideal system, uh, that's the only one that works for us. We'll dive a bit deeper into DC Thompson later this episode. But while we're on the subject of subscriptions, it's a great example that it's never too late to launch a subscriber offering. The publisher launched paid digital subscriptions for their daily news brands, The Courier, The Press and Journal, Evening Telegraph and Evening Express in 2020, and within 18 months had passed 25,000 subscribers. This has given editor Craig Walker renewed hope in local news models. I think if you talk about for us, I think we've already seen that we are definitely heading in the right direction. We went from basically zero digital subs to now a couple of years down the line, we've definitely got a a growth model there. You know, I think for my entire journalism career, just over 20 years, has been talking about uh, managing decline and that's, that's print sales. And I think now when you look at print, we're still talking about trying to manage that as best we can um, to allow us to grow the digital side of things. But we've seen significant growth in digital subscriptions since since we launched um, two and a half years ago and it's continuing to grow and we see um, the opportunities there. Editorial and commercial are perhaps sometimes unfairly pitted against each other in media. But a common theme that came out from all our interviewees was that for any business model to be successful, the content has to be good. Social Spider's David Floyd shares his thoughts. My contention at the moment is that in the UK, we're at a very basic level in terms of that. The problem in London boroughs is that in the vast majority of them, there is not any local news product that is in any way any good. For the first starting point is, is how can we produce a good local news product which a hypothetical individual person in a local area who wants to know what's going on and wants to find out about more about their local area could reasonably want to read because it would be useful to them. And then once you get beyond that, you may want to use exciting and unusual methods to refine that approach. But currently, that, that basic thing of how do we produce a good product is not being fulfilled in any in any meaningful way in, in, in as I say in most London boroughs and in many other areas beyond the big cities in, in the UK. So so it really is we've got to fix things at that basic level and then and then begin to move forward. The Public Interest News Foundation's Jonathan Heward thinks that the old print local news model of trying to cover a breadth of content just doesn't work in the digital space. Instead, publications need to go deep and focus on content national brands can't cover. Maybe the best way to think about it is the distinction between breadth and depth. So if by scale we simply mean breadth, that you just try to reach as many people as possible, then that's basically the corporate game, I would say. The assumption is, even if we only get 0.0001p per click on an ad, if we're getting 100,000, a million, 10 million, 100 million, clicks, then those 0.0001Ps will start to add up and pretty soon we're talking real money. Um, So that's breadth, but but then but the nature of the content and the nature of the engagement is incredibly shallow if that's the strategy that you're pursuing. Unless you've got the resources of a big, big national brand like the Mail or the Guardian or the Times or the Telegraph, which can do scale in a way that has also got quality to it. But I think what we're seeing in the regionals in the UK and we're seeing it in other markets as well is a sort of very pure focus on breadth. I think the, the the converse trend, which I think I'm probably more in favour of, but I'm not saying it's easy or going to going to sort of win out, is is depth, where you say yeah, it's a different 
we're not trying to be modest. You know, we are looking for a sort of scale. You know, we want to be big, but we want to be big by going deep into the community. And that's what you see at publications like the Manchester Mill or the Bristol Cable or others that we can talk about around the UK. They're not trying to reach hundreds of millions of people. They're trying to reach maybe a few tens of thousands of people, a fairly significant proportion of the local audience. But they're trying to reach them with stories that really hook them in, that really sort of get them coming back and seeing that site as a, an ally, as a, as a as a partner, as a you know something that's on their side, not just the thing that you hit for seven seconds to find out what time Strictly is on tonight. Yeah. Dundee-based DC Thompson has undergone a huge digital transformation project over the past few years to break down the print versus digital divide. It's starting to pay off in terms of mindset changes and workflows, as Group Features editor Jane Savo explains. So on the Sunday Post, we were very much print-focused. Well, the local newsrooms were going through this huge digital transformation um, called Apollo, and that started um, over two years ago. So that was all kind of going on, and I came into that a lot later in the day. So when I came into it, we, we had very much a print features team who were just kind of focused on filling the the supplements that we have, so the weekend supplements, the food and drink supplements, um, and that was very much a separate team. And on the other side, we had digital mini publishing teams who were digital focused, told not to really think too much about print just make sure that they're doing the best job they can for to provide content for online which was great we had two teams with very different um skills and focuses um so one of the things i've been working on is bringing those two teams together so that basically we are whatever we do for print has to work online as well there's not really any room for having just a print feature or just a digital feature it has to work for both so I'm trying to bring this into the middle which has been a challenge because the mindsets on both sides are quite different and the skill sets are different but it's actually been quite amazing to work with the two teams and bring them together um, because we're able to the digital guys are able to teach um, our print journalists more about the data and using the dashboards And we've got an amazing audience team as well. So we're bringing it together, we're learning together and we're really kind of analysing what is working online and trying to stop doing the things that aren't working online, which means redesigning the print products to really fit with what's working online. So it's just bringing those two things into the centre rather than just, oh, that's a print feature or that's a digital feature. Perhaps unsurprisingly for a features editor, Jane is passionate about the place of features in local news content. She explains why surprising and delighting audiences with good quality feature content can actually encourage them to stick around for longer, something that's important to publishers of every business model type. I've always been really interested in features, but newspapers felt it was news, very news first, whereas I suppose part of my job and the reason I've been put in this role is really to we see features as being a, a, a really integral part now in the content that we're offering, there is a real kind of problem with news avoidance and trust, um, as we know, across the media, the nationals, um, it's a real issue there, and locals less less so. But this idea of if we can just, if we can surprise and delight the audience, we can tell them stories that they might not have been expecting and build the habit. So coming up with franchise ideas, um, health and wellbeing. In fact, you talked about business there, or food and drink. Stories are some of the most read and most engaged with. And quite often that's focusing on local food and drink, local entrepreneurs, young rising star chefs, um, the stories behind the businesses, the coffee shops that people frequent. They've been largely really popular. So, yeah, I mean, I think this idea of, of features not being important is actually the opposite to that features are seen as is incredibly important and, and especially with stopping the churn. So someone might click on a, a crime and court story, which they very often do. It's one of the biggest drivers because, you know, they won't have a nosy or maybe it's somebody that, that they know might be involved, but then they might be more likely to then unsubscribe immediately because they've had, you know, got what they came for. But with, with features, the hope is that you can really engage them and, and keep them for longer. 
so people might stick around for the features. A common criticism of some well-known local media sites is that they cover too much easy fluff stuff. But as long as it's relevant and serves a local audience, fluff has its place in local media too. I mean, that's right. I worked at the Daily Record for eight years and we we were known as the fluffs. (laughs) Um, I feel like I'm having my day in the sun now that we're we're actually like seen as as important again. And, And I think you're seeing that across the media landscape from the New York Times to The Guardian. They're all investing in their features, their health and well-being, their lifestyle, especially since lockdown and, and the pandemic. I think people are more interested in how they can look after themselves and they're looking for something positive. There's been a lot of dark times recently and I think that filters down to what, what we're looking for locally as well. On a local level, we want to be, we spent a lot of time in our communities, didn't we, um, during lockdown and, and I think a lot of us rediscovered our own backyards and we are telling people this is what's going on this is what people are up to in your area you can get involved with that too you know spot a uh, highlight and inspirational people that could be somebody that they live next door to it's that kind of feeling of community and that we are part of that community and we are living and working among you and celebrating these people these normal people with extraordinary stories in the first episode of this series Dr Vibke Moving said that she believed the root of the issues many local news organisations were facing was that they forgot about the needs of their users. Ensuring content is genuinely high quality is one part of solving this puzzle. Doug Smith, lead architect at Table Stakes Europe, says that an audience's first approach is vital to get right in order for the business model to fall into place. So if you think for a moment of a living in some place, wherever it may be in any uh, nation of Europe, whether it's a small, medium, big city, whatever, wherever you may live, think about the difference between, say, a single parent and a foodie. Now, what we like to say to folks is, if you're a news business, you have to distinguish among audiences, and that for any particular audience, there may be up to five jobs that you do for that audience. The first two are very familiar. And when I usually do this, I put myself in the position of being an audience. So I say, help me, or sometimes us. So help me, you know, have what I need to be a good citizen in the place that I live. That's that's pretty familiar. Help me have the confidence that you, the news enterprise, are holding the powerful accountable in the place that I live. And then I usually put powerful with an asterisk to say, that's the government, that's the private sector, and that's the NGO sector. Don't think it's just the government, okay? Uh, So those two are pretty familiar. Number three is, help me solve the necessities of my life in the place that I live. Number four, help me enhance the quality of my life beyond the necessities in the place that I live. And number five, which is the one still not done enough, help me work with others in the place we live together to make that place better. Now, if we go back to single parent versus a foodie, if you're on on a desk with regard to uh, whether it's politics, whether it's education, uh, whether it's housing, transportation, you're on a desk in some local uh, news organization. If your audience are single parents, you've really got to focus on helping them solve the necessities of their lives. Now, yes, if they're a single parent who's a billionaire, you know, maybe you shouldn't have to worry about that. But that's not obviously what we're talking about here. Meanwhile, though, if you're on the culture uh, or whatever related desk and the audience is foodies, you're helping them enhance the quality of their life to the extent that they're vegans. It's solving the necessity of their life. So you see what I'm trying to get at. Our legacy of, as journalists is very much focused on jobs one and two, not on three, four, and five. And when you take the audience's first approach and you really get good at three, four, and five, it changes what is in the article or in the story. It just changes it. And uh, that's when journalists and others start to get that, the curves of success are identical. 
there's more subscriptions, there's more advertising, there's more readership there, you know, it just goes up because there are people out there who face those problems. DC Thompson's Craig Walker put in another vote for the audience's first approach, saying that prior to bolstering their audience team and looking at engagement, they were making so many assumptions about what their audience wanted without actually knowing for sure. We say digital first, but I would definitely say audience first. You know, it's where's the where's the right place and the right time for that content to be shared. Um, and now we we know so much more about the content that we create. I think um, again, it's it, it sounds maybe silly as an editor, but for for years you would discuss stories and plan campaigns and decide front pages based on what we we thought we knew. And I think in reality we actually didn't know an awful lot or too much or, or nowhere near as much as we know now. But I think now with um you know the data capabilities that we have and we've only um you know in the last year we have increased our, our audience team um to work with the journalists to to look at that data. And but for us it's all about engagement. People have different models, you know, whether it's scale and page views. But for us it's about reaching the audiences and engaging with them. You know, we've got a metric that um, is called a quality read, and that measures how people are engaging with the content. So through clicking on the story, scrolling down, average time spent on it, um, etc. And that's how we, um, you know, measure the success of a story is how people are engaging with it, and that allows our journalists to then respond and react. You know, through that data to see this is actually landed with the audience. There is an interest in this, and um, how can we continue to to serve the audience and their, you know, their needs. Emily Hewitt has been the head of audience development at DC Thompson for just over a year now. She says that data is a vital part of understanding those audiences and developing that subscriber relationship. What we're trying to do is understand all the different niches and how we can, I guess, taper the way in which we work to deliver that stuff. And it all comes back, in my view, it all comes back to truly understanding the data, what are your readers doing? What do they like? What's building the habit? How do we convert a casual reader into a loyal one, into a brand lover? And that kind of thinking easily sits across all of our different communities. Group Features editor Jane Sava is optimistic about the investment DC Thompson has made into its communities, paying off for sustainable subscriptions growth, and perhaps more importantly, trust in their brands. Yes, I do think I feel optimistic this idea of we're more invested in our communities now um, than ever before. Lockdowns, this hybrid way of working means we are spending more time. There may be a news avoidance and there's a kind of a a trust issue with the fake news. Thanks, Donald Trump, for that one. Um, But this idea of not being able to trust the media as a journalist, it used to be you'd be quite proud to tell people you were a journalist and now you're kind of almost doing it as if you've just said, you know, you're a lawyer or an estate agent. But um, I think local papers have the power really to gain that trust back because you've got local journalists who are living and working within their areas. I think there's an idea that you can probably trust that person more um, because they live and work where you live and work and it. And it matters what matters to you matters to them. So I think in that side of things, I think there is a lot to be optimistic about in terms of gaining that trust. And the fact that we are going for this subscription model, I think, is really encouraging because we are forced to create content, quality content. So this idea of clickbait, which used to drive most journalists uh, to distraction, that feels like it's dying now. And um, the more local newspapers take on this subscription model, the more the more people will kind of get this idea of, yeah, co- quality content doesn't come for free. And that's probably changing the mindset. That will begin to change. And also, we can't forget that we are still selling print. We are still selling newspapers. I think if you look back 10 years or so ago, you'd probably think that was all gone now. But I mean, we are still doing that so being able to use what we've learned on digital to inform what we're doing in print and, and bring those two things together means that we can we can protect print while we're building this new future model of subscribers. So we've got a good balance, hopefully, to get that balance right that we can be sustainable for the future and, and whilst we're planning for the future. 
The final publisher we're featuring here is Italian newspaper Giornal de Vincenza. They took part in Table Stakes Europe and created a multimedia project around Vincenza Football Club, as it was really important to their local audience. Nicola Negrin, editor-in-chief, talks us through the project and why it was important to their wider business model. Uh, decided to find an audience and we decided to find the audience of uh, our football club, who is Vicenza. You have to think that uh, our team, for a long period, uh, play in the Major League in Serie A. Then also we win uh, a cup and in the 1997 we play with Chelsea in the semi-final of the European Cup. But uh, in the last 20 years, so from the 2001, we are in the second or third league, second or third, third or second. And uh, uh, even if the club play in the second or third league, we have 7,000 of subscription to the stadium every year. And so we think, okay, there are so many people who want to watch the, the club and pay for it. Because Vicenza, the, the club, is like football, the soccer, uh, is so important. And so we decided to, to focalize in this audience and create a project, a multimedia project, uh, who keep in relationship the website and, uh, and the print. And uh, the project is say, it's only football. It's like to say, okay, it's only football, but uh, we talk about only football. So in Italy, um, è solo calcio. <laughs> and so this is this give up uh, big opportunities to create uh, a multimedia project and to involve uh, people of uh, the the newsroom that uh, look with uh, not not so uh, they are not so fascinating about the web because they say oh web is going to kill, kill us but for me for the other guy Nicola who work from with me uh, it's like it's only an opportunity and so the people uh, in this period are going to see that ah, okay uh, you create uh, uh, it's uh, like a, a group and you, we are trying to create a community because uh, a, a solo calcio and it's only football uh, we, we call the, the house of the, the football fans. As part of their aim to build trust in their journalism in the community they got fans to participate in the events something which almost throws back to the old days of local journalism when people could see themselves in the print papers. This is a beautiful example of translating this for the digital age. The fans so could uh, participate to, to, the, to, this, uh, to this event. It's like, we are trying, it's not so easy uh, because uh, uh, people are not, um, they have to create also the habits because uh, it's not so too easy to, to, to watch for an hour to a video in the, in the PC or, or, or the, the smartphone. But it's going well. Also, the podcast, we talk about football in a not, not serious way. We are going to joke. We are recording 52 episodes. <laughs> we are going to, the, uh, and so this year, um, maybe we are going outside the newsroom and uh, recording some bar or other place because they invite us. And so it's like a way to um, create a relationship with the, the, the territory. And also, uh, for me, it's very important uh, uh, that people uh, see the journalists. Because maybe uh, sometimes people uh, think about the journalist what's um, an entity. No, we are real people and common people. Uh, and, and so it's going well. Although it's early days, the publisher is placing importance on digital subscriptions as part of the title's future. Now they have to work on communicating that to their audience. We have to communicate to the people what we are giving some content, exclusive content. And we have, for me, to create like vertical and deeper content. You know, don't, I, I don't know if you know The Post. It's a media of, uh, an only website media in Italy. Mm -hmm. And they are collecting success because they uh, started to, to make a slow journalism. Okay, so uh, to comment what the, the journalists wrote, it's so easy. And they and then to um, tell the people to speak to the people in a clearly way, 
and a deeper way and to, to, to give description of the reality, but basic, but deeper. Uh, they have made, made many success because uh, the people want this in their way. So if we're talking about the, the young generation, they want a video, a short video. But for me, we have to uh, return to this. Because what, uh, in, in these 18 years, what I say is that the, the old generation think about the newspaper like, uh, like I, as I say, the entity. We are over the people. Now, for me, we are here for the people, to serve the people and to, 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 to talk with the people, to try to understand what the people want um, and to be more, more, more simple, more deeper for, for us give the people what they want, not to give the people what we want. We have to go to the people, not say to the people, oh, come here. No, no, we are coming to you. There were a number of common themes which came out across those publications. But first and foremost for me is that the community has to see you as valuable, whether that's through high quality features, community building, or coverage that matters to people. Social Spiders' David Floyd says that whichever revenue streams publishers are working with, local communities have to be on board for it to be successful and sustainable. I think there's some cross-cutting themes that we would all share in terms of how do you genuinely engage with the community, making sure you're actually talking to local people about what they want from journalism and getting, getting that feedback, finding different ways of getting local people to participate in what you're doing and and, and, yeah, and to understand the process of creating journalism and, and how that works. Uh, so, so, so so that definitely exists as a kind of cross-cutting theme. And and you know the the starting point that local news matters and and we exist to do as good a job as we can in terms of creating the best possible product, that is also a cross-cutting theme amongst you know a movement of of publications, but um, yeah, that's also something which is shared by a number of the you know what are sometimes described as legacy brands. That you know, there's, there's some, particularly amongst the independents, there's some of them which are doing a really good job in in that sense as well. Uh, I I think where there isn't yet a crossover is in terms of business models because there there are, there are some people coming from the more you know, independent community side who, who are a bit more focused on grant funded approaches to to journalism. Uh, and I think there can be a positive role for philanthropy and journalism uh, in uh, funding particular elements of it. But I, I would be very wary of, of looking to philanthropy as, as the, the ongoing source of, of funding. I think to, as much as possible, it, it's got to be about local communities, you know, which you include both residents and local businesses and other agencies, collectively deciding that local news matters in their area and channeling that resource towards it. The danger is if, if you're looking at is some you know enthusiastic American billionaire going to fund you know, your your publication that works fine as long as they're interested in it, but you know, they're not going to be interested in it for a hundred years. So if, if you're actually looking to build sustainable models, I think it really is how do you convince local communities that what you're doing matters and is of value to them and, and how do those local communities decide that you know, they also think that and they value local news and want to support it so that's really what I think we need to be looking for. One issue we've seen rear its head in recent years in the UK is that long-term investment and tough transformational processes like the ones undergone by DC Thompson are often not in the interests of shareholders. The Public Interest News Foundation's Jonathan Heward explains. The ultimate problem isn't necessarily the execs and editors on the ground in the UK. It's the financial imperative, you know, that's, that's pushing them in a certain direction. And I think that's, that is very hard. So I think, you know, there, there, there is good economic analysis. If you talk to Douglas McCabe at Ender's analysis, he will be able to really show you that actually there's a really good economic argument for those companies to invest properly in on the ground journalism. And to do the kind of more reciprocal, human-based community engagement activities that so many in the independent sector are doing naturally. You know, there is a business case that will generate long-term returns. But the challenges are those investors and owners and shareholders really looking for long-term returns or do they want a quick hit and then they want to get out. 
I'm not, I don't work in a city. I don't have sort of a huge insight into what motivates those people. But I'm assuming if it is like, I want to get my investment back in three years, local news is not the right place for them. However, platform money is also not a sustainable option, however tempting it may be in the short term. And publishers shouldn't be relying on big headline deals from legislative or other measures to support local news. I think what I've increasingly come to believe is actually it's not like that with the, with the big tech platforms in relation to news. There is there is a big difference there. I do think they benefit from news. You know, we can discuss about how much they benefit and the nature of that, but I think there's a bottom line that they do benefit from the fact that they can provide a, a portal, whether it's through search or social or an aggregator, to a lot of content that's been very expensive to produce for a lot of people. And they create more economic value out of that than the content producers do. So I'm I'm in favour of a more regulated settlement. Now, I know obviously the platforms don't want that and are going to push back very hard against it. And one of the things they're going to threaten is that, well, look, look at all this lovely stuff we've been doing for years, funding all these good initiatives as good, you know, philanthropists. We're going to stop doing that. And I have to say, I sort of, like, you know, this is a really hard one. But I think I come down on the side of saying, well, ultimately, if that's the price for a more transparent and accountable relationship between the news industry and the big tech industry, I think it's a price we have to pay. And I think ultimately, even if that means that big tech, you know, we get a regulated arrangement, publishers go to big tech and say, actually, I think you owe me £73 million. And big tech says no. And you go to the regulator and the regulator says, actually, to be honest, they're right. They don't owe you that. We've looked at the data. They're not profiting to the extent that you say they are. It may sound like cutting off your nose to spite your face, but I think I'd still rather be in that place than where we are now with it, with this kind of piecemeal drip feed. Oh, we'll throw some crumbs there. We'll throw some slightly bigger crumbs over to sort of bigger outlets like News UK or The Guardian because they've got more political muscle. I don't think that's sustainable either. And I think even if we had that worst case scenario where actually big tech owes the news industry nothing, well, maybe that then stimulates serious innovation on the news side where we think about, well, what's the kind of platform model that we'd like to have that has got a healthier relationship with news? There's rightly a lot of cynicism around big tech when it comes to supporting publishers. After all, some have been burned by Meta's recent shuttering of its own initiatives supporting journalism projects. Financially, Google has done more to support local news and news initiatives than any of the other platforms. But why does news really matter to Google? Just a note here that this series is supported by the Google News Initiative. Benedict Autre gives her version of why local news is important to Google. So, if you think about what Google is about, and this is important because if you if you keep that question in mind, it, it also helps differentiate with the other big tech uh, providers. The core of our product is search. And what does search do is connect users with answers to their questions and sending you to that answer. The pandemic has shown that people are very and even more so interested in what's happening in their local communities. And I, I don't think that's going to go away and that's going to be reinforced even more so. So from that sense, Google has an interest in providing relevant information to the people where they are and connecting them with answers to their questions that are the most relevant. And so if you think about it, it's a kind of, uh, it fulfills our commercial mission, if you will, because we our revenue is made on the back of advertising uh, when people look for something. And, and frankly, everything that Google does is centered around the users. There is also an ecosystem play that is at stake. So we're very alive to the health of the ecosystem for us to serve our users very well. So I think of it as the uh, triangle, so where you have the users, the advertisers, and the publishers. And so if you think about the needs of the users, you have your answers as to why Google is interested in local news. And also um, users come in very shapes. And so the plurality and the diversity of the information that the users are presented with 
is crucial to the quality of the search result. So, so there is an intrinsic mission to have that diversity and plurality in how we present the information to the users. Much of the Google News Initiative's work is focused on supporting publishers to find sustainable models rather than just handing out money. Benedict says that the company is trying to find long-term solutions to support the ecosystem. It's in our interest that the providers of quality information are healthy and sustainable in the long future because then we have a healthy information ecosystem. So, so we're very much in it to find solutions for the long term, but we should not be the one dictating what those solutions are. We should uh, enable the, the publishers to find the path that will work for them and link to their strategy. We should not be dictating what it should look like. That's all for this episode. Thank you so much to our guests for their input and to my co-host Peter Houston for the many hours he spent conducting the interviews for this series. Part one, a big picture look at the state of local news, is live now and should be available just below this one in your podcast player. Part three will be live next Wednesday, so make sure you're following Media Voices on your podcast platform of choice or you can subscribe to our daily newsletter over at voices.media. If you have any thoughts from this series that you'd like to share, you can get in touch with me on news at voices.media or even better, start a post in our community forum. You can register for free on voices.media and join the 100 plus other publishing professionals already discussing everything from third-party cookies to SEO struggles. A final thanks to the Google News Initiative who are supporting this series. They work with publishers and journalists to fight misinformation, share resources, and build a diverse and innovative news ecosystem. Find out more about their programs, tools and resources at newsinitiative.withgoogle.com. Next week, our third episode will be looking at company culture and internal transformation to get local news organisations into the best shape possible. Until then, goodbye.